Otobasi Tom. Alongside with Otobasi Tom is Jolly Edem, and we hope to have you glued as we walk this political spectrum road. Indeed, indeed. We hope to have you stay put and uh, like in the routine, we'll take on the updates first, then we dive into the main issue of discourse, which of course, you know, now is the peak of politics exactly. and everything seems to be happening with the speed of light. <laughs> Talking about back to back, as the race for the office of the commander in chief heats up in the country, there has been no shortage of uh, intrigues, plots, and subplots on the part of politicians who are eyeing the most converted political office in the land. I'm talking about the presidency. Well, according to a report, President Mohamed Bari had ordered the country's security agencies to carry out a thorough investigation into the political activities of the members of his cabinet. The president is said to have stalled the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, and the Department of State Service, TSS, to find out why presidential campaign posters of the central bank governor Godwin Emefile and almost half of the seven ministers are flooding various parts of the country. President Boria Lur's reactions came barely hours after pictures of dozens of stations, wagons, vehicles wrapped with Emefile's campaign posters surfaced online. Well, quoting a source from one of the security agencies, the media outlets alleged that the president who was embarrassed that a serving CBN governor and serving minister under his administrations are already making moves to succeed him, even while his tenure was yet to come to an end. The president is concerned with some of these issues now. <laughs> I know when you have that smile, I know that something is biting. Now, what's biting? You know, uh, about um, uh, the reports uh, that wrote that the president is embarrassed. Mm. That, yeah, that's why I was actually smiling mm. right? because um, I think that's um, being sensational about it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, maybe they've taken it a bit over the top. Mm. You see, Godwin Emefeli and every other minister in the cabinet of this existing federal administration, mm. they have the right as Nigerians to aspire. The Constitution guarantees that. Absolutely. So, so I, I, I think, like I said, it's sensationalism, saying the president's embarrassed. However, my key concern in that um, report is the fact that... Um, it says the president has ordered the EFCC to investigate all these ministers. You know, when, when I hear things like this, it makes me um, have some mixed feelings, sadness, sometimes confusion. Because if we look at what happened in the last um, U.S. presidential, uh, um, after the U.S. presidential elections, we saw violence at the Capitol and mm -hmm. all of that. We could see heads of security agencies in the United States rising to the occasion. We did not hear the president has uh, commanded or instructed mm. the DG, the director of the FBI, mm. or the head of Homeland Security, mm. or the joint chief of the army, or they know their job. So I think we, you know, in this, at this point of our democracy, we should have evolved beyond that point where the president has to give matching orders. These people have constitutionally stipulated duties, and they should just do it. So I would have preferred a situation where somebody says, I'm running for the office of president. Of course, we know anti-corruption has been at the front burner of this administration. Mm -hmm. Whether they have succeeded or not, exactly the reason the president is making that. To say. Mm -hmm. But I would have loved a situation where somebody aspires, and at, and in, at the end of the day, the EFCC, ICPC, the police, come up to say, no, you can't run, you have cases to answer, the void of the president having to issue matching orders. Well, uh, the president is coming from this angle. The administration is still ongoing and yet to come to an end, at least until May 29th, uh, President Mohamed Bari's tenure is yet to elapse. And if that is the case, then governance must continue. Now, you have almost all the persons, a larger number of persons, in this cabinet vying for the office of the president. Okay, that's aside. Meanwhile, they have not openly declared their intentions. The likes of uh, Senator, uh, former Senator, Gosfield Obudokwabio, who is the Honorable Minister for Niger Delta, is always, uh, posters are out, but he has not declared. He has not told the people. Uh, Minister for Transport, 
in the same line. Now, God will name the same line. Now, these persons have not come out to tell the president like what uh, Alaji Bolatinubu did. He went to the president and said, okay, I'm running for the office. So, the president is not aware of the aspirations, but there are posters flogging around. So what the president is concerned at this point is, who is the brain behind all these posters? Yeah, he, he's worried around. about interference with governance. Exactly. Well, it's simple. It's it's very simple because we are. This is the electioneering period. I don't want to call oh. it the election year because mm. the election is next year. And in, in mostly third world countries, Nigeria as a case study, governance end a year to the expiration of that administration. You see a lot of um, John getting racketeering, people lobbying to get the spot. Mm. And you know, very early in the course of the, of, I think late last year and then in the early course of the electioneering phase, mm. the APC had already zoned their presidential seat to the south. So I can assure you that given an opportunity, every cabinet member from the south has an aspiration. Mm. To run for the presidency uh, of until country. spoken out, uh, it, it remains with them. Well, like President Obasan just said, maybe some of them are waiting <laughs> for a group to okay. buy forms for them before they make it open, mm. and then maybe some of them are still lobbying from behind the scene in order to cut their elections cost money. So nobody wants to go about doing consultations when you know that mm. you won't eventually well, be the anointed it, it, candidate. That, that's important. If we are to do what happened at the just concluded the PC National Convention where people were, were made to, I could, I, if I used the word forced, mm. I wouldn't be wrong because remember Honorable Ndukao even had to come to stage and even cry and say, look, I'm not stepping down for anybody. Mm. I still want your support. So I think maybe some of them knowing the body language of Mr. President, the APC might want to go the way of consensus in picking a presidential candidate. Absolutely. So maybe some of them are just lobbying from behind the scene and do not want to come out pop and plain mm. to say, I am running, get a form, and so for now, they will still be denying those posters and all of that. But for now, I think we will see more of, um, we will see less of governance mm. and more of politics. Well, at this point, one would think uh, if all these ministers uh, are vying or per venture, they come out to declare their interest. What happens? Where would they get money to fund their campaign? Yes, some of them are buoyant enough. Agreed. But then uh, the president, from another angle, seems to think that uh, it would be absurd or it would cost much because they are already in the cabinet and that they might somewhat dip their hands into the treasury to get money to fund these campaigns. And you, like you said, elections cost money. Well, you know, when, when we are talking about elections, politicians can lack money for every other thing, but not mm. for elections. <laughs> yeah, it's their, it's their core. It's their, in fact, for many pr uh, politicians, elections are like pet projects, mm. okay? Like what the beauty queens, would, some of them would want to give um, water to a rural community. Mm. For a politician, first and foremost, is elections. So they could hoard money through the course of an administration. But trust me, that election year, money will come out. Money will come out, it is. <laughs> okay, moving away from that, Professor Chukuma Saludo. Governor of Anambra State has given assurance that he will lead the people of Anambra State to negotiate in a dialogue with the federal government of Nigeria to stop the agitation of IPOP. And uh, just last week, uh, when he uh, sent a memo for all uh, public servants to return to work on Monday uh, for the fact that uh, the state is losing a huge chunk of money in billions uh, because of the sit at home order and that that has actually led him to say that no sit at home order must stop uh, we all have to drop arms and then go to dialogue and one of the issues on the dialogue table is that uh, namdi kanu should be released of course so uh, he will he said he will lead his brothers governors uh, in the Southeast region to engage with the federal government in dialogue to handle the insecurity situation in the zone. Uh, Saludo stated this in an uh, expeditious release of a leader of prescribed indigenous people of Biafra IPAP. I'm talking about Namdi Kano, who resolved the insecurity in purse in the zone. He said this during a one-day peace building insecurity dialogue held on Saturday in uh, Oka in response to the deteriorating security challenges in the zone. Well, uh, he seems to be the mediator at the moment. Well, um, Anambra is the hotbed of IPOB activities. Mm. Anambra is the hotbed, and him leading the charge only seems the right thing to do. 
you know, looking at the personality of Suludu, I hope a lot of good things come out of this because I, for one, I am really impressed with his first footings, mm. uh, you know, especially the direction of making sure that he buys made in Anambra yeah. first. And where Anambra doesn't have that uh, thing in production, mm. he buys Nigeria. We can see his um, official cars and that of his deputy mm. are made by Innocent, a brand in Anambra state. And he has said that every government official will use that particular brand. But now about the IPOP debacle and then um, approaching the federal government to ensure the speedy release of Mazinam Dikanu. Mm. Well, you see, sometimes when you lead the kind of movement Mazinam Dikanu led, would Nam Dikanu be willing to say, okay, I'm not pursuing this cause anymore? You know, he has a lot of believers who believe in that Biafran cause. Mm. So if he says, okay, because if you want the federal government to let Namdi Kanu go for the sake of peace, Namdi Kanu too has to commit to peace, but this time the terms of the federal government to what will be at the fore. How will this sit with his supporters? Would they not leave him? So I, 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 I fear a situation where Namdi Kanu is let out and it even engenders more violence because at that point some people will denounce him as their leader because some people may feel betrayed. But how that would go with the federal government when they meet the federal government eventually, I do not know, but we'll watch out. Well, I want to believe they've already done that because there was a peace summit meeting held in Oka and uh, both traditional rulers were involved, uh, security agencies were involved. And I want to believe that Namdi Kanu, uh, at some point, he has a lawyer who supposedly would be maybe present in that meeting for some reasons because he needs to be in the meeting to know uh, what's the possible best solution because he might have to also communicate the response to Namdi Kanu himself. So I want to believe at this point uh, uh, they must have done their homework and whatever dialogue. Uh, let, I hope let's, they let, let's, <laughs> let's really hope so because I'm saying so in light of... Um, um, let me take uh, our minds back a bit to Boko Haram. Mm. You know, when Shekau was the leader of Boko Haram, there were some people within the ranks of Boko Haram who felt he was too soft. Some people felt um, he had been bought over to become soft. And then came um, ISWAP, Islamic State West African Province. And then they got a new leader whom they, I think Banawa, I think Banawa, something like that. So, Banawi or so. Well, so, the, the activities of IPOP, you will say, does not, you know, correlate with what no, no, uh, the I'm talking about. No, no, I'm not looking at In terms of dialogue? I'm not talking about mo a mode of operation. Mm. I'm talking about leadership now. Oh. So, I am afraid of a situation where Nam Dekano says, okay, let's, I, I drop this agenda. Would those people who are ardent believers in the agenda, ardent believer in Nam Dekano, would they not see this as a betrayal on his part and then break ranks with him and forge ahead with the agenda, still keeping the peace not yet brokered? Well, if, if they have accepted to, to climb down on the seat at home order unanimously, I, I want to believe that there's no much uh, limits to what they can achieve together. Let's hope so. Let's hope so it is. <laughs> well, moving away, Mr. Peter will be the former vice president during the 2019 general election, says that uh, he has the charisma as one of the world's economists and social political leaders to handle the personal rush uh, conditions of the nation at the moment. In an appeal to the national leadership of the party, he co his co-aspirant and uh, other informed concerned pdp supporters should consider him as the ticket to ensure equity and fairness peter obi says this well he was addressing the journalist that after he received the 2023 pdp presidential nominations of interest form bought for him by a group known as young professionals to support his aspirations at the Onisha GRA resident. Well, uh, talking about uh, group buying forms, uh, uh, former President Lucio Guno Basenger said, had, uh, <laughs> said we should not vote them. Then he said he has the charisma uh, to change the narratives in Nigeria. Well, if uh, the president, former President of Basenger's words is anything to go by, that we shouldn't vote them because they have already started lying. Well, we agree that uh, at some point, people purchase the uh, nomination form for sitting current president Mohammed Obari and he won the elections. That's true. So why would we say they are lying?
Um, well, well, I think um, pres former President Obasanjo, he, he's seen it more than me. So <laughs> if he knows some of them more than me. Mm. So if he says they are lying, who am I to say they are not? He's not. Or perhaps uh, they are not, or perhaps they are lying. Uh, well, um, well, it could be true and false. Mm. Some may actually have bought it. But you know, the thing with having um, people buy the form for you is um, a way of telling people, ah, they really want me to run. Yeah, it's like an endorsement. Exactly. So I think they want to take their first footing with everybody wants me to run. That might just be the idea. So perhaps uh, former President Basson John may be right and mm. wrong in some cases. Well, it's what it is. The forms have been bought. The my, my political concern parties is are that, going that you get no money. That, that you get endorsed. Does that translate to any any benefit at all at the nomination, at the primaries? Or does that guarantee that people, you know, a group came together and said, oh, I actually share your vision. I think you can make Nigeria work again. Okay, let's contribute money and buy it, you. It's not a guarantee. How does, that, how does that promote your candidacy or your aspirations? How does that get you a party stick in it, the it's first not, place? It's not a guarantee and it's not uh, in any way going to make you get the party ticket. But remember, it's a race. It's like okay. running a 100 meters race, and while the other people are at zero, you've been pushed to five meters. It's an advantage. Mm. So if people feel you're so popular, and then a lot of people want you to run, mm. and then your, your, your competitors, let me put it that way, bought the forms themselves in actuality, and then you got a group of people come together to say, we want this person. It's an advantage. It's like you're five meters ahead already on the 100 meters track. Well, uh, uh, Charles Soluzo, the current governor of Anambra State, seems to take a, a different trail. He said that uh, he is not comfortable. Anambra State Governor, Professor Charles Soluzo, uh, he is uh, predecessor's William Obialus remains innocent until found guilty of misappropriation of public funds. Governor Soludo, while reacting to the investigation of Obianu for alleged embezzlement of 5 billion naira short P funds and 37 billion naira security votes, the EFCC uh, have come up to say that after arresting the ex governor, disclosed that part of the funds was also alleged used to finance political activities in Anambra State. Well, uh, he believes he's innocent until proven otherwise. Well, that's what the law says. That's, That's what, what the, the law the says. And then I am also worried about the spate of media trials. The EFC get to put a lot of people through. Mm. And you know, in some cases, in some cases, you see the EFC lose these cases. And then you've already um, humiliated, embarrassed these people. I would prefer a situation where the EFCC has a higher kill ratio. By that, I mean more prosecutions. Instead of these media trials, they put up, you know, people seeing former governor Willie Obino in EFC custody, looking stranded, you know. So it looks more like this is what they hope to achieve other than actual prosecutions. Mm. So I would actually like to see more kills than actually the fanfare, because that's what I would prefer to call it. Well, since last year when they actually marked him on the watch list of the EFCC, a lot of condemnations came following that. Well, if you are actually watching uh, Governor Winnie Obiano as a den, I, I don't see why you should announce it to the public. I think that was the time you were supposed to get your facts right, get your, your figures right, get evidence, gather uh, enough evidence to see that once uh, he's snapped, you charge him to court almost Im immediately and then the trial begins. And then whether or not he's guilty, uh, the people will get to know after the judgment and not before the judgment. I think uh, most of these mars the EFCC's chances of getting uh, uh, some convictions. I think I can agree with that too. Mm. Well, uh, this is where we'll put the pause here and go on a short time out. When we return, uh, we'll be having our guests in the studio to talk about uh, the current uh, insecurity uh, challenges we have in Nigeria at whose benefit. That will come up after this time out. Please stay. Glad to have you back. Yes, the show is your political spectrum reaching your life from the beautiful hills of Ibiakuran. And yes, this program is live on our different social media handles on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Instagram. Use the handle at Spectrum TV, NG, and let's connect. Uh, well, a lot of persons seem to, you know, say that uh, terrorism, you know, anything war crisis uh, is profitable to some persons at some end or whatever, whatever that is. Uh, maybe perhaps you do not share that opinion. But that is our concern for this morning. And you will recall to put a little light on this. Uh, in 2015, Gulag Jonathan 
was accused of sponsoring Boko Haram in, uh, by Erevai in a tweet on Twitter. Now, the former special assistant to former President Gulag Jonathan Remomoki has taken out his time to dig out the tweets, of which uh, is really trendy at the moment. Having established this, this the case at, at, at the moment, uh, what would you say, going back and forth, you know, he's of the opinion that if Erofi at the moment accused former President Gulag Jonathan for sponsoring insecurity or uh, killings in the northern Nigeria, and now he happens to be the governor of Kaduna State, and we're still having a replay of the same thing. Uh, what do you make of that story? What, would you say uh, he's also partly responsible for the insecurity in, the, in Kaduna State? Okay. Um, the Actually, when we talk about terrorism, I think that's where I should start from. Because uh, many people, you know, any, any um, maybe physical attack, most people want to tame it as a terrorism. Mm. No, terrorism, you know, um, is a threat to national security. And it comes under, it comes under the, because when we talk about the threat, you know, there's the, they are grouped under traditional threats and then the non-traditional threats. Mm. Even under the traditional threats, we have things like uh, sabotage, okay, Sabot um, which is attack on material. I mean, um, not just that somebody maybe could kill a driver if that was the only driver around to do the work or even a doctor, you know, just to sabotage the... And then um, that may not be terrorism. And uh, terrorism, there are specific um ingredients that will uh, just just like maybe you accuse somebody of stealing you could you could even find with the property but if the ingredient that the he had the intention to permanently deprive the owner of the property which is key is not proved um it's not established you you can't uh, call him it he cannot be convicted for stealing so that's why i i just wanted to start by uh, just uh, defining terrorism what what really constituted terrorism and uh, i just took time out to make a little note on some of those let let, let, let me just read the classical definition out uh, clearly it says terrorism the unlawful use of force or violence against individuals or property in an attempt to coerce and intimidate the public and government to achieve political, religious, or ideological objective. An actual attack or threat of one can directly impede and paralyze activities. So, I mean, so what are the distinguishing figures? It talks about political objective, religious objective, and uh, also ideological objective. So, but today, the state of public security is so so terrible that i mean criminals are emboldened even the like the recent attack on the train okay because usually what happens in the military any such incident there's going to be a careful investigation to establish was was it a, you know um a, what, what what may be called a, a criminal attack because the idea is preventing it not just sweeping it down, oh, this was terrorism. So, because today, even like that, talking about, we're saying about 21 people are still missing. Who are they? Were they even the targets? Because now people have been exploiting, making money from uh, kidnappings and all that. And all those are criminal gangs. So, so it may not fall under terrorism because now people may look at Boko Haram and it may not be Boko Haram or the Fulani headsmen. So I, I just wanted to, to make that, uh, that well, distinction. We're talking about mm. bandits now. Yes. And uh, a guest of ours has actually said that by all forms of operations, banditry is uh, terrorism. Do you share the same thoughts? No, no, no. He's, he's very, very wrong. Because uh, we have uh, allowed so much deterioration in uh, public security that criminals are so emboldened. Um, 
we, we've known even not just in Nigeria, there was a time in France that uh, um, people, you know, that's uh, even attacking banks to source money to fund other things. So, you know, all forms of band is not terrorism. No, it's not. Those are, those are criminals. And we need to treat them as criminals. We need to pursue them as criminals. And uh, we really need to address that. Terrorism, there's an objective, you know, ideological, religious, or political. But so if it doesn't fall under that, no, no, it's not. It's not. Mm. Okay, sir. We, we've seen that uh, the federal government has proscribed um, long before now Boko Haram as terrorists. And then we've also seen them proscribe IPOP. But um, the so-called bandits, in quotes, the federal government have refused to proscribe them as terrorists. And going by the definition you just read, I like the letter part, disruption of activities. Now let's go back to the train incidents. Now the train, train travels can't be on because of the activities of this so-called bandit. And hearing how they operated, the first of all blew up the tracks with explosives. At the level of armaments these people have, can we still just call them criminals? Mm. Of course. Because uh, what is happening is that, I mean, the train, sorry, the train, um, before the train, they were able to hijack people from the road and uh, ask for their, I mean, uh, um, what do you call it, for people to pay. And people have been paying. So, I mean, the train became like a kind of uh, criminal activity. Yeah, a savior. You know, many, most people were now going by train and uh, in fact, even uh, I do also advise my children, please don't go by road. So the, the point is that the train is a soft target. And uh, when, I, when I look at the number of uh, soldiers they say they're putting on there, I say they can't do much. Because if it is derailed, you know, and uh, even like they use explosive, a train is a soft target. And you cannot line, um, yes, uh, troops all along the years. Uh, so it's, it, it may not be a terrorist attack unless we are able to establish that this was carried out either by, uh, by uh, the Boko Haram or even their sister networks. I mean, uh, okay, because they, they now claim affiliation to ISIS. So, yes. No. Okay, sir. No. Very, very quickly, there are people who opine that um, it might just be this government trying to save face by not admitting that Boko Haram that had been contained prior to the emergence of this administration, that had been confined to the northeastern part of Nigeria, has been able to have a footstool in north central and northwestern Nigeria. So they have refused to call them Boko Haram and just decided to go with the name bandits because some people also argue that these acti banditry activities are means via which um, Boko Haram raise money for their core operations in the Northeast and uh, because um, the military has been able to cut on off so many other sources of their cash flow. So would you agree with those positions? Could this really be Boko Haram operating under a different guise just to raise funds? It is a possibility. It's a possibility, but uh, there is no, I mean, uh, concrete evidence to support it. Uh, but the point is, is that our borders are so porous. And uh, I, I was in Kano, 76. I was so impressed by the integrity of the average Northern Muslim. You know, they are kind, they are sympathetic, they are understanding and they are patient. And this normally recommends them even to people, you know, and they're very accommodating. Uh, but um, having said that, it, it now becomes a weakness to them when it comes to the issue of security. Uh, because you, you find out that even with, the, with this, with this is, I mean, the way might have any riots, you know, okay, sectarian riots, uh, people will say, ah, the, the Northern Muslim, did not condemn, I mean, the, the young people getting involved with this. It's, it's almost like their nature. You know, what I mean is that they're not fast to condemn people. They're so accommodating and often very patient. And uh, so actually, this, this sectarian problem grew 
from that 81 Mitosini riots, you know, to it kept building or kept developing. And then the, with the emergence of this Boko Haram from Medugri in 2009, it's, uh, and now it has, it has spiraled really out of control. Look at Kano presently. You know, Kano, because the indigents are wise enough to say, no, you will not operate in our territory. Because I was listening to El Rufai talking about uh, the army, Air Force, um, Navy, police. So I just smiled. You know, somebody I respect so much. In fact, what he did in Abuja and all that. Somebody, but apparently when it now comes to the issue of uh, this insurgency, I, I realize that is uh, um, significant, significant, is really ignorant about the solutions because it is, um, many people made that mistake thinking that it's, it's, uh, it's the army or the military. No, we cannot solve Boko Haram that way. The underlying factors that has brought this problem must be addressed. Otherwise, I mean, we will just be wasting lives of uh, young people and all that. No, the un underlying factors must be addressed. It's not, in, in fact, look at insurgency in any part of the world. Normally, they will always revert back to a political solution. Today, they, I mean, uh, we are still having open borders, ready to welcome Fulanis from any part of the world. Uh, that's a typical uh, northern uh, northerners uh, attitude. But we have serious problems that we need to begin to review that aspect of uh, that level of hospitality now, you know, because these arms that the people are using, um, the proliferation is mainly from the northern, um, all these uh, other Chad, Niger, you know, and uh, most of the arms that came in uh, mean that, uh, you know, Libya, Gaddafi that held Libya together was, was killed and everything scattered and the level of armament that was, I mean, in that country, now it has almost uh, spread all over the sub-region. So it's actually not, not the military problem, you know. It is, it, okay, I shouldn't say it's not the military problem because this, the, 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 the way we put it is that usually it's not just it's sufficient to identify the threats. It's also, I mean, the other thing that is so important is how all aspects of national power must be deployed, you know, in finding solution to these threats. Well, uh, a lot of Nigerians seem to be concerned about uh, the Nigerian system. Because that statement was made in 2015, where we had the peak of insecurity. And that was an election year. Fast forward to 2022, we are beginning the process to you know, usher in new political uh, leaders at different, different uh, angles in, in all states of the Federation. And now we seem to be seeing issues of insecurity you know, on the increase. Uh, we're concerned at this point. Could it be uh, because all fingers seem to be pointing at insincerity of our leaders, of Nigerian leaders in tackling security? Would you say uh, if there's some form of benefit for them uh, for, because of insecurity? No, 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 no. I, I will no. not say that. But I will just say, you know, <laughs> um, let me borrow, borrow a word from, uh, sorry, a sentence from uh, Wole Soinka. You know, talking about people being lettered, but functionally illiterate. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry to put it like that. But, but I think that's a major challenge in, in, when we look at the leadership class. Um, and then uh, most of them will just think that it's political expedient to say anything. And that does not, you cannot make, do politics with insecurity. And that was what APC did. And then they raise the expectation so much that, I mean, without looking at the, on the challenges, the actual solutions, you know, they, they, they were so superficial in their, I mean, uh, promises. Yes. So, because if they had actually looked at the underlying causes, I mean, and what it would take, they, they, they wouldn't have made those comments and those uh, noun. They came in and then they realized that, okay, I, I was just looking at, in fact, I've, I, felt, I felt so sad over the years because when I said I went to Cannes, I was in Cannes first 76, the 
number of industries in Kano actually competed with Lagos. True. Kaduna too had, there was quite a lot of industries. But all these have been decimated by, uh, by this uh, insurgency and violence. You know, the, the, you talk about the cost of this violence. Is, I mean, it is put at about 2.4% of our GDP. And the, 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 the actual economic impact of insurgency is also estimated at about $142 um, billion. Dollars. So, and, uh, but then, so, but then, when you now, why I'm even mentioning all that, when you look at the North, if I was invited for a presentation once by a group from Dubai, from UAE, because they were selling property in Dubai, and Nigerians were buying. Then I was confronted with this fact, you know, during the presentation, that in 1965, the people came to Nigeria to borrow money. And Nigeria did not give because they just looked at that place as a piece of desert. But look at the vision, what, what that has transformed. I said that to be able to say this. The, the economic, sorry, the, all, all resources last year was just four trillion. That's about eight billion dollars. And Israel, that same even with the COVID. The agricultural sales was in billions. Potatoes alone <laughs> was uh, 105 uh, million. That was what they got from the sale of potatoes, export of potatoes. And that translates to about 52 billion naira. You know, at the nominal, nominal exchange rate of about uh, five, uh, 500 uh, naira too. And look at the vast north. And I read somewhere that Bauchi states has more water than the whole of the Middle East. So, so, so our governors there, I said, how do you come and everybody focusing on oil and then you fail to develop the potentials and give these people hope? Like if there's no vision, even the, the, the initial uh, governance, sorry that I'm taking time on this, mm -hmm. uh, you find out that it showed that they had vision a bit. Because when they talked about... Um, Green Revolution Operation Feed the Nation. But I look at even the El Rufai. What, what, what is your focus? What is your strategy to lift the country out of the perennial poverty, biting poverty, in fact, serious poverty? So why will the people not join with uh, bandits? Why would they resort, not resort to banditry? So it's, it's not just that there, maybe that the people and uh, the governors are benefiting, but it, I think it's just that they, they are so ignorant of the solution or they do not have the political will to pursue the solution. Okay, sir, for, for want of time, you, she, the, the, she, the question I want to drag us back a bit on the question she asked, could, they, could it be that insecurity is lingering because some people are benefiting from it? You know, you were talking and then you mentioned that insurgency has cost Nigeria over 2.4% of our GDP. And, our GDP. Yes, yes. and then if you look at the military alliance NATO, the requirement for every NATO member state is to spend um, at least 2% of their GDP on defense. So we, that's now holistic spending, proper procurement, having ac access to their risk. But now looking at Nigeria, a country that's not at war with another country, being uh, spending over 2.4% of their GDP on insurgency, would you still firmly say, or would, you, would it still be very safe to opine that the governors are actually ignorant or because there is something to gain as long as this lives on? Oh, well, I, I think they have something to gain. If, but I don't, because when I look at the, um, the amount of money given as security votes, I'll be wondering, I say, what? What are they using it for? You know, so, and, and because then that's really something to gain. They talk about security vote and what aspect of security are they using it for? But uh, be that as it may, I think the, 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 the North, really, the leadership in the North really need to sit up because like uh, I'm talking about, we basically, they need to, um, 
look at uh, the, the resource base of the north. Um, look at the resource base of the north and they need to do something about it. You know, I would, last time we talked about going to sleep. I mean, uh, on our watch. In fact, the I, it, 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 it's well, kind of I, disconcerting. I understand, yes, I, I understand. but, but mm -hmm. uh, real quickly before we call it a wrap on the show today, uh, what would you say, because you've mentioned is ignorance on the part of uh, some Nigerian leaders, uh, what would you say is the way forward to end uh, insecurity, terrorism, as the case may be, once and for all in Nigeria? Do you see a way out? Oh, oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, there's a way out. And especially, let me even talk to, I mean, uh, especially uh, Rufaida, this... Uh, the articulate yeah. because you you look at it the insurg the the greatest impact now is boronu adamawa and the uh, kaduna states so there must be zero tolerance for i mean attacking any because when they attack southern kaduna and all that that is uh, largely christian nobody talks about yeah nobody is held accountable yeah. so why would they not be emboldened to to do more but deterrence will only come from putting your foot down and saying, you know, that you will not tolerate any, whoever he is that goes to more than one person, it should be prosecuted. In fact, that, that, that had been the problem for, uh, because for quite a long time, the, it has been considered that, that it is the inability of the federal government to address sectarian violence in some part of the country is what has encouraged the spread. You know, the Boko Haram sect, you know, and all that, you know, because people were not, I mean, if you put your foot down, there are sponsors. And he said, so they know them. So why don't you go after them? Well, so sir. it's about putting your feet down on the ground. Yes. And addressing the issue the way it is, regardless who is hurt, whether it, Christians or Yes, yes. Otherwise, if you just give it, because we know the perpetrators, mm. the sponsors. No matter, who, why don't, if you go after them, because that's going to be the deterrence. You know, it will deter other key leaders from whatever they, they think they would benefit from uh, um, sponsoring group, or encouraging. Group yes. I'm afraid we have to cut you for want of time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, your last words, something I picked from it is are the sponsors. Maybe when next we have you on the show, we would look at um, sponsors of um, perhaps this act of terrorism and banditry mm -hmm. and um, maybe look more into it. Thank you very much. Well, Thanks, that's sir. the size of the political spectrum this Monday morning. Thank you very much for being on the show. Like you said, we look forward to another conversation in this line. But until then, this is where we signed out. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Otobasita. My name is Jolly Edem. Thank you. <laughs>